9. The disappearance of Paula Jean Weldon in the upper northeast of the United States, in the area around Glastonbury Mountain, lays a mysterious area of land. The Bennington Triangle is a part of the world where strange tales of people vanishing from the face of the planet are in abundance. One of the strangest and certainly one of the most bizarre accounts, for example, is that of James Tedford. Tedford, a military veteran, and resident of the Bennington Soldiers' Home, was returning home, by bus, on the first day of December 1949, following a Thanksgiving Day visit with his family. Many people would testify to having seen Tedford on the bus, including the driver, who would distinctly remember him getting on. When the bus arrived at Tedford's destination, however, he wasn't there. On his seat, there was simply the bus schedule he had held in his hand as he sat. Of all the people spoken to, despite all recalling seeing Tedford on board at the previous stop before Bennington, not one of them could remember him exiting the vehicle. The Tedford case is just one of many to come under investigation by Joseph A. Citro. It is Citro who first brought the attention of this strange piece of land to the mainstream. Before we look at Citro's work, however, the short video below gives a little background to this mysterious place. Researcher and author, Joseph A. Citro is largely responsible for laying the foundations of research into the Bennington Triangle. A particular surge of strange disappearances in the last half of the 1940s caught his interest. Experienced hunter, Mitty Rivers, disappeared while leading a hunt along Route 9, sometimes called the Long Trail. On 12th of November 1945, people would search the area for days. The only item found would be an unspent gun cartridge of Rivers. On 12th of October 1950, came the disappearance of eight-year-old, Paul Jepson. His mother returned to her truck where she had left him while she finished a chore, to find him gone. His body remained undiscovered. However, tracker dogs tracked the young boy to the same stretch of road where Mitty Rivers vanished five years previously. A little over two weeks later, Frida Jackson went missing while hiking in the area during a camping holiday. The Jackson case is different to the others, in that the body did eventually come to light, in May 1951. However, its location, a wide open field with no cover, was subject to a thorough search five separate times. Had it been dumped there by someone, or something, following the searches, had it simply appeared in the same way that she had seemingly disappeared? Incidentally, the cause of death was inconclusive due to the advanced state of decomposition of the body. The disappearance that captured the nation's attention, however, was that of a young, local college student. Before we look at that case though, the short video below looks at some of the mysterious disappearances of the area. Perhaps the most high-profile disappearance in the Bennington Triangle area is that of 19-year-old Paula Weldon. The FBI led the search for Weldon. A reward of $5,000 for information leading to her recovery went out to the public. The last sighting of the Bennington College student had been on the long trail on 1st of December 1946. This is the same stretch of road as the other disappearances. Numerous witnesses would recall seeing the young girl, but none of them could offer any significant clues. Maybe the strangest statements came from an elderly couple, who very well may have been the very last people to see her. They were around a hundred yards behind Weldon when she came to a corner on the trail. They arrived at the same corner a matter of seconds later, by which time, the teenager had seemingly vanished. Some claimed that Weldon had secretly crossed over the American-Canadian border with a mystery boyfriend. If she had, it must have been a spur-of-the-moment decision. She had taken no clothes, documentation, or any money with her. To this day she is still missing, according to Citro, and others who subscribe to the theories that something otherworldly resides in this area of the United States. Weldon was very much a victim of the Bennington Triangle. The short video below looks at this particular case a little further. As you might imagine an area with so many strange legends, would also produce as many equally strange theories. And you would be right, given some of the strange displays of light seen in the area, some believe UFOs to operate here. Others, citing some of the Native American legends believe a portal of some kind resides within this strange land, or perhaps the disappearances are connected to the Bigfoot sightings reported in the area. The vast untouched lands would provide ample cover for such a creature to remain undetected for example. Some researchers have also pointed out the majority of disappearances seem to occur between October and December. Is this coincidental? 
or might that be something worth investigating? While this seasonal theory might easily explain the disappearances, and link them to some kind of animal, or Bigfoot, attacks, it might also be the result of something even more calculating, and chilling. If, as some believe, the disappearances are the work of a serial killer, what is special about this time? Why do the months of October, November, and December, seemingly present an opportunity to kidnap and murder for them? Or perhaps this seasonal activity might be related to a natural phenomenon, one that is capable of transferring anyone unfortunate enough to be in the vicinity at the time, to somewhere unknown? For now, until serious scientific study meets unconventional thinking, the theories will continue. Check out the documentary below by Matt Garland, which looks at all aspects of the Bennington Triangle. 10. The Flannan Niles Lighthouse Disappearances Near the highest point of the uninhabited isle, Eileen Moore, in the remote outer Hebrides Isles off the western coast of Scotland, there is a lighthouse that has gained notoriety over the years, after three of its keepers mysteriously disappeared in 1900. According to Historic UK, the island was named for St. Flannan, a bishop from Ireland who built the first chapel there. The Northern Lighthouse Board commissioned the lighthouse, designed by David Allen Stevenson, to be constructed, beginning in 1895. The light was turned on for the first time in December of 1899. In 1925, it was the first lighthouse to have a telegraph installed, and in 1971, it was completely automated. A pad was put in place to allow helicopters to land. On December 15, 1900, a steamer en route from Philadelphia to Leith noticed the lighthouse was dark as they passed the islands, and they duly reported this to authorities. The lighthouse was staffed by Donald MacArthur, Thomas Marshall, and James Duckett. A fourth man was available for rotation but did not live on the island. On December 20, Relief keeper Joseph Moore was scheduled to arrive on the Hesperus, the ship used to deliver supplies, but the adverse weather had caused the ship to delay its planned visit until noon on December 26. Upon arrival, the crew found the island deserted. Moore checked the entrance gate and main door, but both were closed. The living quarters were in good order, aside from the unmade beds, and so the only curious thing Moore had noticed was that the clocks had stopped. He returned to the ship to get help for a mass search of the island. One of the keeper's rain gear was later found, leading the men to believe someone on staff had gone outside in a storm without it. No signs of the missing men were found on the island whatsoever. More than three volunteer seamen stayed on the island to guard the lighthouse while the Hesperus went back to the mainland to notify the Northern Lighthouse Board. Their telegram, dated December 26, 1900, stated, a dreadful accident has happened at the Flannans. The three keepers, Duckett, Marshall, and the occasional have disappeared from the island. The clocks were stopped, and other signs indicated that the accident must have happened about a week ago. Poor fellows, they must have been blown over the cliffs or drowned trying to secure a crane or something like that. Meanwhile, Moore and the other men continued searching for clues as to what happened. The eastern end was undamaged. But the western area showed damage from recent storms, iron railings were bent over and had been pulled out of the concrete, and a boulder, weighing at least a ton, had moved. The missing keeper's logs were current up until December 15 and contained recorded remarks about the damage. No clues or evidence were ever found. When the press published the story, it caused a torrent of national speculation and wildly imaginative ideas about what could have happened. One story suggested that one of the keepers had murdered the others and was so full of remorse, that he committed suicide by leaping into the sea. Other rumors claimed that foreign spies or aliens had abducted the men, or that supernatural forces were at work. A more sensible theory speculates that one of the men could have been washed away in a large wave if they had been near the coastline. Another may have run up to the lighthouse to get help and these two men may have suffered the same fate while trying to rescue the first. While this does not explain the closed gates, it may have accounted for the raincoat left behind. 11. The bridge at Overtown that calls dogs to their maker. 16 miles northwest of Glasgow, in Bucolic West Dunbar Donshire, stands an elegant baronial mansion on rolling green acres overlooking well-tended gardens and the River Clyde over which spans a stone bridge. Built in 1862, by a wealthy industrialist and since bequeathed to the town, Overtown House has been used over the years as a convalescent home for war veterans, a youth center, 
and the backdrop for movies such as Cloud Atlas. Today you can spend an afternoon imagining yourself as royalty at the Overtown House Tea Room, called by visitors the gold standard of tea rooms. But underneath that tranquil civilized veneer lies several dark mysteries, featuring ghosts, murder, and suicide, of dogs. James White was a retired lawyer when he bought the grounds that would become Overtown in 1858. His son moved in after his parents' death, and was elevated to the peerage in 1893. After her husband's death in 1908, the grief-stricken lady over town was said to have paced across the bridge until her own death in 1931. Some locals insist her sinister presence haunts the grounds today, including one author, Paul Owen. I was up there one summer's day and I felt a very strong jab, like a phantom finger, twice in my back he told the Huffington Post UK in 2015. It was the sensation you get when you fear someone might push you over the edge of a train platform. A truly gruesome crime occurred in 1994, when a schizophrenic suffering paranoid delusions threw his baby over the bridge and attempted to kill himself, but was restrained. His conviction was overturned by reason of insanity, and the man was committed to a mental hospital. But perhaps the estate's oddest claim to infamy is that it is said to be the site of dog suicides. In the 1950s, locals began calling the stone over town bridge the bridge of death because dogs had been leaping off it. Indeed, as many as 50 dogs over the past 50 years have jumped to their death. According to the UK's Daily Mail, some 600 have survived the leap. Some locals theorize that a nearby nuclear base was emitting a terrifying frequency only dogs could hear. Cassie, a Springer Spaniel belonging to a horrified local nurse who watched her dog go over the wall, lived after the leap. There is no way my dog did it on purpose, Alice Trevorrow told The Sun in 2015. There is something sinister going on here. It was so out of character for her. Donna Cooper's collie, Ben, survived the fall but with a broken back and sadly had to be euthanized. Hold on just a second. Of course, we've all heard stories about old, sick, or lame animals who've crawled into hiding places to await their deaths. But can a dog intentionally and purposefully end its life? Can a dog commit suicide? The answer, say canine experts, is number. It is impossible for a dog to premeditate its own death, according to Dr. David Sands of the Animal Behavioral Clinic in the U.K.'s Lancashire a canine behavior specialist who was contacted in 2005 by a British TV show about the mystery. So what was going on? If the bridge was not a platform for depressed canines, why were so many ending their lives there? There were a few clues. Many of the dogs who'd leaped were long-nosed breeds, characterized by exceptional sense of smell. The dogs jumped between two ramparts on the right side of the bridge, on clear sunny days. Dr. Sands visited the site with the eyes of a trained specialist. There he discovered that a wide, flat path led to the entryway to bridge, which is covered in ivy, masking visual cues that mark it as a barrier on the other side of which lies a 50-foot drop. Water rushing beneath the bridge creates a kind of oral distraction. Under the bridge lives what you might expect, squirrels, mice, rats, weasels, but also mink, which produce a distinctive odor irresistible to hunting dogs. The scent is most pronounced on sunny, dry days, as rain and humidity would tamp down the smell. A naturalist who visited the area with Dr. Sands confirmed the presence of mink, which was introduced to the area during the 1950s, back when the doggy deaths first occurred. So a sentry acting dog gambling on a bright sunny day might go charging over the wall without knowing what it was doing and without hearing his own heart crying stop. Suffice it to say my final verdict is one of misadventure rather than suicide, concluded Dr. Sands on his clinic's website. The explanation has not caused an end to the accidental deaths. Alas, today if you take Fido on a walk around the Overtown grounds and come to the bridge, you'll see warning signs. Dangerous bridge, please keep your dog on a lead. Good advice. 12. The Big Gray Man, Amphir Lathmore known also as the Big Grey Man of Ben McDewey, or simply as the Greyman, is the name given to a creature said to live on Ben McDewey, the second highest mountain, which is situated in the Cairngorm in the eastern highlands of Scotland. Stories about the Greyman have been recorded as early as 1791, though the most famous account was given in 1925 by a highly respected scientist and mountaineer who was on Ben McDewey in 1891. 
actual sightings of this creature have been rare. The 1925 account, for instance, did not even involve a glimpse of the Grayman. Despite the lack of sightings, the Grayman has often been described as being 3 meters, 9.8 feet, in height, with very long arms and legs, an ape-like head, and covered in short hair. The Grayman has also sometimes been compared to the Yeti of the Himalayas or the Bigfoot of North America. Nevertheless, the Grayman is not a creature of flesh and bone, but has been likened to a ghost. Regardless, all who claim to have had encountered this creature were filled with dread. The earliest known account of an alleged sighting of the Grayman dates to 1791, and comes from by a poet by the name of James Hogg. The poet is said to have been tending sheep on Ben McDewey, when he saw the creature. It was a giant blackamoor, at least 30 feet high, and equally proportioned, and very near me. I was actually struck powerless with astonishment and terror. Terrified by what he saw, Hogg fled home, only returning the next day to collect his sheep. The creature returned, and this time, Hogg is said to have decided to conduct a little experiment. The poet took off his hat, and he saw that the creature did the same as well. Thus. Hogg concluded that it was his own shadow in the fog that so terrified him the previous day. Although Hogg had proven that the creature he saw was just his shadow, the story of the Grayman had been born, and its existence seems to have become a reality. In 1925, a speech was given at the 27th Annual General Meeting of the Cairngorm Club in Aberdeen by Professor J. Norman Colley, a professor of organic chemistry at University College London, and a mountaineer. The professor spoke about his experience on the summit of Ben McDewey back in 1891, which has since been quoted rather frequently. I was returning from the cairn on the summit in a mist when I began to think I heard something else than merely the noise of my own footsteps. For every few steps I took I heard a crunch, and then another crunch as if someone was walking after me but taking steps three or four times the length of my own. I said to myself, this is all nonsense. I listened and heard it again but could see nothing in the mist. As I walked on and the eerie crunch, crunch, sounded behind me, I was seized with terror and took to my heels, staggering blindly among the boulders for four or five miles nearly down to Rothmurch's forest. Whatever you make of it, I do not know, but there is something very queer about the top of Ben McDewey and I will not go back there again by myself I know. The professor's testimony is said to have sparked a sensation, and soon, other hikers too reported that they have had similar experiences on Ben McDewey. They, however, did not share their stories prior to this due to fear of ridicule. Most stories about the Grayman revolved around these elements, a feeling that one is being followed, and sounds perceived as following footsteps. Such sounds could have been produced by one of the many animals living on Ben McDewey, and not necessarily by an unknown creature like the Grayman. Few sightings of the Grayman have ever been made and the closest pieces of physical evidence that we seem to have of this creature are its alleged footprints. In his book, Romantic Strathspey, James A. Rennie wrote that he had seen and photographed large footprints in the snow in the Spey Valley, about 24 kilometers, 15 miles, from Ben McDewey. On a later occasion, Rennie had the opportunity to see how the footprints were formed. These footprints, according to the author, were not formed by some mysterious creature but by precipitation. It seems that there is not much solid evidence that point to the existence of the Grayman. Hogg's creature, for instance, was his own feeling, whilst Trenny's footprints in the snow were formed due to precipitation. Furthermore, it is usually a hiker's own feeling that he, she is being followed on Ben McDewey that has contributed to the tales of the Grayman. Even Collie's story, which is normally regarded as the most authoritative, speaks about the professor's own gut feeling. Moreover, it has been said that the professor was himself a believer in the occult, and therefore, was perhaps likely to have felt that he was being followed by an unknown creature whilst on the summit of Ben McDewey in 1891. 13. The Lost Colony of Roanoke It seemed too good to be true. And it was, nearly 20 years ago, Excavators digging on North Carolina's remote Hatteras Island uncovered a worn ring emblazoned with a prancing lion. A local jeweler declared it gold, but it came to be seen as more than mere buried treasure, when a British heraldry expert linked it to the Kendall family involved in the 1580s. Roanoke voyages organized by Sir Walter Raleigh during Elizabeth I's reign, 
The 1998 discovery electrified archaeologists and historians. The artifact seemed a rare remnant of the first English attempt to settle the New World that might also shed light on what happened to 115 men, women, and children who settled the coast only to vanish in what became known as the Lost Colony of Roanoke. Now it turns out that researchers had it wrong from the start. A team led by archaeologist Charles Ewan recently subjected the ring to a lab test at East Carolina University. The X-ray fluorescence device, shaped like a cross between a ray gun and a hair dryer, reveals an object's precise elemental composition, without destroying any part of it. Ewan was stunned when he saw the results. It's all brass he said. There's no gold at all. North Carolina State Conservator Eric Farrell, who conducted the analysis at an AQ facility, found high levels of copper in the ring, along with some zinc and traces of silver, lead, tin and nickel. The ratios, Farrell said, are typical of brass from early modern times. He found no evidence that the ring had gilding on its surface, throwing years of speculation and research into serious doubt. Everyone wants it to be something that a lost colonist dropped in the sand, added Ewan. He said it is more likely that the ring was a common mass-produced item traded to Native Americans long after the failed settlement attempt. Not all archaeologists agree, however, and the surprise results are sure to reignite the debate over the fate of the lost colony. The settlers arrived from England in the summer of 1587, led by John White. They rebuilt an outpost on Roanoke Island. 50 miles north of Hatteras, abandoned by a previous band of colonists. White's group included his daughter Eleanor, who soon gave birth to Virginia Dare, the first child born of English parents in the New World. White quickly departed for England to gather supplies and additional colonists, but his return was delayed by the outbreak of war with Spain. When he finally managed to land on Roanoke Island three years later, the settlement was deserted. The only clue was the word Croato and carved on a post, the name of a tribe allied with the English and the island now called Hatteras. A Q archaeologist David Phelps, now deceased, found the ring while excavating a Native American village there and took it to a jeweler named Frank Riddick in nearby Nags Head. Phelps reported that the jeweler tested the ring and determined it was 18 karat gold. Riddick, who now runs a fishing charter company called Fishy Business, recalled recently that he didn't conduct an acid scratch test typically used to verify the presence and quality of the precious metal. Since this wasn't about buying or selling, we didn't do that, he said. I just told him that I thought it was gold. Phelps apparently didn't want to subject the object to potential damage. A senior member of London's College of Arms subsequently noted that the seal on the signet ring was of a lion patent and suggested that it might relate to the Kendall family of Devon and Cornwall. A master Kendall was part of the first colonization attempt in 1585, while another Kendall visited Croatoan, when a fleet led by Sir Francis Drake stopped by in 1586. Though this link was never confirmed, the object was nicknamed the Kendall Ring. Since Phelps thought the ring was made of a precious material, and likely belonged to the Elizabethan era, he argued it was an important clue. That doesn't mean the lost colony was here, he told a reporter at the dig site after the ring's discovery. But this begins to authenticate that. Some archaeologists, however, were skeptical of the artifact's connection to Roanoke, given that it was found with other artifacts dating to between 1670 and 1720. About a century after the Elizabethan voyages, this was also an era in which brass rings showed up at Native American sites up and down the East Coast. But Mark Horton, an archaeologist at the University of Bristol in the United Kingdom, says that Ewan's results don't necessarily preclude that it belonged to a Roanoke colonist. The fact that the ring is brass actually makes it more similar to other British examples, he said noting that the ring could have been made in the 1580s. I would argue that it was kept as an heirloom, passed down, and then discarded. Horton is currently digging at the Hatteras site where the ring was discovered. The excavations, sponsored by the Croatoan Archaeological Society, have so far uncovered several artifacts that may have been made during Elizabethan times, including the handle of a rapier and bits of metal from clothing. If the lost colonists left Roanoke for Croatoan in the late 1580s, argues Horton, they might have brought along their most precious objects, 
Over a couple of generations they may have assimilated with the Algonquian-speaking Croatoan people and their English heirlooms would have eventually worn out. Oh, there's Grandad's old sword in the corner rusting away, said Horton. Why are we keeping that? His theory is also based on archaeological finds that show that Native Americans on Hatteras manufactured lead shot and used guns to hunt deer and birds by the 1650s. Prior to this, their diet was based heavily on fish and shellfish. The technological sophistication, Horton suggests, hints at the presence of Europeans before the second wave of English arrived in the area in the late 1600s. That, too, could point to the presence of assimilated colonists and their descendants. That theory is a stretch, says archaeologist Charles Heath, who worked with Phelps and was present when the ring was found. Such items would have been used, modified, traded, retraded, lost, discarded or curated by their native owners, and subsequent native owners, for many years, he argued. In the end, he said, a stray 16th century artifact found here and there on the outer banks will not make for a lost colony found. Horton acknowledges that rather than Roanoke colony possessions brought along by assimilating English, the Croatoan people could have acquired the goods from Jamestown, the later Virginia colony to the north. Instead, gunflints, coins, and glass beads found at the site almost certainly came from the newer English settlement. But he is confident that the current excavations will soon reveal additional evidence. Meanwhile, the hunt for the lost colony continues. Another group of archaeologists working about 50 miles west of Roanoke Island at the head of Albemarle Sound say that they have pottery and metal artifacts likely associated with the lost colony. The digs by the first colony foundation were sparked by the 2012 discovery of a patch concealing the image of a fort on a map painted by John White. But like the finds at Hatteras, the objects might be associated with the second wave of English settlement. Last fall, a dig by the National Park Service at Fort Raleigh on Rowan Oak Island, thought to be the site of the original settlement, yielded no trace of the colonists. But earlier in 2016, archaeologists did find a handful of fragments of an apothecary jewelry that almost certainly date from the 16th century. That the gold candle ring is likely a cheap brass trade item won't derail the quest to find out what took place on the Outer Banks more than four centuries ago. As for Ewan, he hopes that the analysis of the ring will help put researchers back on track in their search for scarce clues to the Roanoke settlers. Science actually does work, he said, if you give it time. 14. The Circle of Ill Letters In 1977, Circle of Ill, Ohio school bus driver Mary Gillespie started receiving anonymous threatening letters postmarked from Columbus, which expressed anger that she was having an affair with the local school superintendent, Gordon Massey, and warned her to come clean about it. Mary kept this from her family until her husband, Ron Gillespie, received his own anonymous threatening letter warning him to inform the school board about the affair. The Gillespies shared the letters with Ron's sister and brother-in-law, Karen and Paul Frassauer, and since Mary had an idea who the writer might be, they decided to send their own letters to this person advising him to stop. On August 19, while his wife was away on a trip, Ron received a phone call at home which made him angry and compelled him to grab his gun. He told his children he was going to confront the letter writer and drove away in his pickup truck. Later that evening, Ron was discovered dead inside the truck, which had smashed into a tree. Even though his children did not believe he looked drunk, Ron had a blood alcohol level of 0.16. Curiously, Ron's gun had recently fired off a shot, but the bullet was never recovered. In spite of this, Pickaway County Sheriff Dwight Radcliffe ultimately ruled Ron's death to be an accident. But local residents started receiving their own anonymous letters which revealed Mary Gillespie's alleged affair with Gordon Massey and accused Sheriff Radcliffe of orchestrating a cover-up. When Massey got divorced, Mary began a relationship with him, but always maintained their romance did not start until after Ron's death. Mary started receiving threatening letters again in 1983. At around 3.30 p.m. on February 7, Mary was driving her school bus route when she saw a threatening sign attached to a fence post which mentioned her daughter, prompting her to pull over and grab it. She discovered that a piece of twine had been used to tie the sign to a small cardboard box, which contained a loaded .25 caliber pistol. Since the trigger was also tried to the string, this seemed to be a crude booby trap intended to fire the gun at Mary when she ripped down the sign. 
but it never went off. Mary turned the booby trap over to the police, who discovered someone had made a half-assed attempt to rub off the gun serial numbers. However, lab tests were able to make out the numbers and the gun was matched to Mary's former brother-in-law, Paul Fressauer, who had recently divorced Ron's sister, Karen. Since Paul won custody of the kids in their house, Karen was living in a trailer on Mary's property. When questioned by Sheriff Radcliffe, Paul claimed he kept his gun hidden in his garage, but since he never used it or checked on it for years, he did not notice it was missing. Radcliffe also made Paul perform a handwriting test in which he showed him the threatening letters Mary had received and asked Paul to copy them as closely as possible. Radcliffe thought the handwriting was a close enough match and used the handwriting samples and Paul's gun as evidence to charge him with attempted murder. Paul was found guilty at trial and received a sentence of 7 to 25 years in prison. However, there was compelling evidence to suggest Paul was innocent. Even though Sheriff Radcliffe told the press that Paul had confessed to writing around 40-50 threatening letters, Paul denied this and said that if he actually made such a confession, why didn't Radcliffe record it? Paul's fingerprints were not found on the letters, gun or booby trap. A search of Paul's house failed to turn up any more corroborating evidence, such as ammunition for the gun, or material which could have been used to construct the signs and the booby trap. Mary Gillespie testified that shortly after their divorce, Paul's ex-wife, Karen, confided in her that she believed Paul might have been the author of the threatening letters she had received years earlier. Paul's response was, if Karen really believed I had done this, why did she never mention it in divorce court? Even though Paul was not working on the day Mary found the threatening sign and booby trap, he had an alibi witness who placed him at his home between 12.30 p.m. and 4.30 p.m. The prosecution responded with a surprise rebuttal witness who testified that he saw the sign along Mary's route between 11.30 a.m. and 12 p.m. that day, but he never notified the police and no other witnesses reported seeing the sign before Mary found it at 3.30 p.m. Years later, it was discovered that a key piece of evidence was withheld at trial. Twenty minutes before Mary discovered the booby trap, another school bus driver driving that route reported seeing a yellow El Camino parked at that spot, along with a sandy-haired man who did not match Paul's description. He did match the description of another man Karen Fressauer was dating at the time and even though Paul did not own a yellow El Camino, Karen's brother did. Shoe prints were also found at the scene which did not match Paul's shoe size. After Paul was incarcerated at a prison in Lima, a bunch more anonymous threatening letters signed by the Circle of Ill Writers started being mailed to people all over central Ohio. Even though the letters were postmarked from Columbus, which was 90 miles away from Lima, Sheriff Radcliffe became convinced Paul was somehow sending the letters from prison. In response, Paul was placed in solitary confinement, denied access to writing materials, and was constantly monitored, but the letters kept being sent. Even though the warden maintained it was impossible for Paul to have sent these letters, he was denied parole at his first hearing in December 1990. A few days later, Paul was mailed an anonymous letter mocking him for this. Paul did not get paroled until May 1994. With the support of an investigative journalist named Martin Yent, the Circle of Ill Letters case wound up being featured on Unsolved Mysteries. But while the show was working on the story, their office received an anonymous postcard signed by the Circle of Ill writer which read, Forget Circle of Ill, Ohio, do nothing to hurt Sheriff Radcliffe. If you come to Ohio, UL sickos will pay. Paul Fressauer attempted to clear his name and wrote a letter to the FBI asking them to investigate Ron Gillespie's death, but nothing ever came of it and he passed away in 2012. Paul and Martin Yent both believe that his attempted murder conviction was a frame-up job orchestrated by his vindictive ex-wife, Karen. In response to their divorce, Karen was one of the only people who knew that Paul's gun was hidden in his garage and after Paul went to prison. Karen regained custody of their children and the house. It's suspected that the original series of letters from 1977 were written by a man named David Longberry, a school bus driver who worked alongside Mary Gillespie and was angry she'd rebuffed his romantic advances. In 1999, Longberry became a wanted fugitive after raping an 11-year-old girl and committed suicide while on the run. It's possible the Circle of Ill Letters saga was two different stories which were linked together when Karen Fressauer used the original series of letters as inspiration to concoct a plot to frame her ex-husband years later.
15. The Tunguska Event On June 30, 1908, the forest near the Tunguska River in North Russia exploded. The sky was split in two. Local observers, thankfully occurring in an uninhabited area, no humans were hurt, though the scorched remains of many reindeer were found. The explosion, however, is thought to be the most powerful impact force in recorded history. Interrupting the tranquility of the isolated forest, 80 million trees fell in an instant. The explosion is estimated to have released 185 times more energy than the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima and leveled 770 square miles. Windows 40 miles away shattered as eyewitnesses watched a giant fireball rise over the horizon. Light was reported to be visible as far away as the United States, and seismic waves were felt in the United Kingdom. As the explosion shook the world, scientists sprang into action to identify the cause of the calamitous Tunguska event. Scientists on the scene noted that the explosion most likely originated from a single epicenter, noting that all of the trees were knocked over in a concentric pattern. One researcher noted a peculiarity at the center, observing that the trees hadn't been knocked over, but had instead been stripped of their bark. It wasn't until 1929, that an expedition would reach the remote location of the destruction. Leonid Kulik, a Russian mineralogist suspected a meteorite was to blame for the whole phenomenon. The locals had other ideas. They feared that the Siberian god, Ogti, had rampaged in the forest. Kulik even had trouble convincing guides to take him all the way to the forest, as they feared supernatural danger. After reaching the center of the catastrophe, Kulik found no crater. Noticing there were several concentric lakes in the area, he reasoned that the meteorite had exploded before touchdown. But after draining a bog and finding nothing but an old tree, he was stumped. Many theories have since been hatched to explain these seemingly strange events, but the area wasn't able to be studied closely due to its location. Some believe that the damage was caused by a crashing UFO that left before it could be discovered, thus explaining the absence of a crater. Others think that an alien spaceship may have intervened and blown up a dangerous meteorite in order to protect the human race. Some astronomers offered that a small comet would have left little evidence as its icy mass melted away. Geologists theorize that a plume of natural gas may have been ignited. Historians have even noticed similarities to the blast patterns exhibited by Soviet nuclear models, both leaving a butterfly-shaped burn pattern. The most likely explanation, the bursting of a meteorite in the atmosphere was eventually given more credit as modern scientific techniques have been able to detect trace amounts of extraterrestrial minerals in the ground and trees of the Tunguska event site. Likewise, similar meteor behavior was observed during 1930 in Brazil, and again in Russia in 2013. 16. The Disappearance of Malaysian Airlines Flight 370 The disappearance of Malaysia Airlines Flight 370, that disappeared on March 8, 2014 while flying from Kuala Lumpur International Airport, Malaysia, to its destination, Beijing Capital International Airport in China, prompted a slew of safety proposals meant to prevent another jetliner from inexplicably vanishing. Yet, almost four years later, that possibility remains. That's because international requirements for new planes to broadcast their locations every minute when they're in trouble do not take effect until January 2021, according to Bloomberg. The disappearance of Flight 370 remains the biggest mystery in modern aviation and the search to find it is the world's longest hunt for any jet. Last month, a new crew resumed aboard the seabed constructor scouring the Indian Ocean. The top Australian scientist who helped pinpoint the new search zone is hopeful the missing jet can be found within weeks. Armed with oceanographic analyzers and a high-tech search vessel, the latest search for the Boeing 777, which vanished in March 2014 carrying 239 people, kicked off late last month run by the private exploration firm Ocean Infinity. In the hope of solving one of aviation's most enduring mysteries, AFP reported, the U.S. company resumed searching with a promise of as much as $70 million from the Malaysian government if successful. Hopes that the new mission might finally find the wreckage have also been raised by the high-tech tools being used. Seabed Constructor carries eight autonomous drones equipped with sonar and cameras that can operate in depths of up to 6,000 meters. They are free-flying vehicles 
allowing them to move deeper and collect higher quality data than the tethered drones used in the earlier search. This means the priority search areas are likely to be scoured and the data collected much faster. In an era where people can track their iPhones and Samsung Galaxy devices in real time, the aviation industry, the world's most advanced transportation sector, still isn't obligated to do the same for aircraft carrying about 4 billion passengers a year, and that one-minute rule doesn't apply to the current fleet of 23,500 passenger planes and the thousands more joining them in the next three years, mostly in Asia, Bloomberg said. You can't say MH370 won't ever happen again, because it will, said David Stupples, a professor of electronic and radio systems at City. University of London. Until 2040 or 2050, there's going to be a large number of aircraft flying around that don't have the tracking system fitted. A gradual tightening starts in November, when airlines must track planes every 15 minutes under regulations adopted by the United Nations International Civil Aviation Organization ICAO. Some carriers already meeting this requirement include Malaysia Airlines, Singapore Airlines and Qantas Airways. Still. A jet cruising at 500 knots, 925 kph, an hour that disappears between 15-minute pings creates a potential surge zone of about 170,000 square kilometers. That's equivalent to about twice the size of the UE. There would be little chance of finding survivors in time, especially in the open ocean, and the sunken wreckage might escape detection for years, said Jeffrey Dell a safety scientist at Central Queensland University in Australia who has been an air safety investigator since 1979. By comparison, the search zone for a plane that crashed between one-minute pings would be about 748 square kilometers, an area 227 times smaller. The industry takes strategic steps to ensure safety but moves very deliberately, said Tom Schmutz. The chief executive of Fleet Aerospace Solutions. Operators have typically pushed back on change because it can conflict with operational profits. Calgary based Fleet sells off the shelf technology that tracks planes by satellite. Its automated flight information reporting system is about the size of a briefcase, costs less than $60,000, and can pinpoint a plane's airborne location every 20 seconds. About 1,800 aircraft have installed the product. Mr. Schmutz said, the slow rollout of more frequent tracking comes during a period of sustained growth for the global aviation industry, especially in Asia. MH370 disappeared with 239 people on board. Experts mapped the Boeing 777's random route over the Indian Ocean after picking through its hourly data hookups with a satellite. Only a few pieces of wreckage washed up in Africa and no bodies were recovered. ICAO said it moved quite rapidly to develop new track in intervals after the MH370 crash, and those rules contain an incentive for airlines to retrofit in-service craft to enable one-minute reporting. Under the rules taking effect in 2021, a plane would switch to one-minute tracking automatically when systems detected it was in distress because of turbulence, mechanical difficulties or an unexplained change in course such as during a hijacking or if the crew became unconscious. Pilots couldn't turn the system off after it activates automatically, ICAO said. The system would deactivate itself once the plane was flying safely again. However, a pilot could turn off the system if it was manually activated. The challenges tied to minute-by-minute -minute tracking include adding computing power and internet bandwidth to process larger volumes of data. The tighter system also may require reserving more space on the flurry of satellites being launched to satisfy demands for constant internet connectivity. The almost seven-year lag that will exist between the disappearance of MH370 and the institution of one-minute tracking shows the struggle going on within the industry. Airlines haven't immediately rolled out tamper-proof tracking tracking technology on every commercial aircraft, potentially at a cost of more than $1 billion, partly because an event like MH370 is so rare, it always comes back to a commercial decision, said Mr. Dell, a former safety manager at Qantas. Does it really justify it when that accident is not going to happen in your lifetime? Statistically, it takes something like MH370 to change people's thinking.